Hi everybody. Sorry a bit late, bit of a uh, problem uh, connecting, so to speak. Anyway, listen, I'm really glad to be back with everybody. Um, and I hope you're all safe. Uh, and at least have been able to enjoy a bit of the sunshine. Um, my garden looks like a sand pit, actually. Anyway, uh, tonight, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about um, my new Tennyson book, which is called Blunt Force. And it's going to be published in August. Um, the interesting thing for me is that, um, I mean, so many people remember Tennyson, Jane Tennyson, um, and the wonderful performance with Helen Mirren in the original Prime Suspect. So all these Tennyson books are letting her grow into being that character. And the last book I think, I hope, some of my fans out there read was um, about the Sweeney when she is in um, the, with the Sweeney and it's called The Deadly Dozen. Is it called The Deadly Dozen? I think so. Oh, I write so many books, darlings. I can't really remember all the titles. But anyway, Jane Tennyson was then in with the Sweeney and she, it was very, very hard for her. They're very tough crew. So I wanted to move her on from that environment. Um, and I don't want to give too much away about where she's going, but um, they kind of really elbow her out. She's just, they never wanted her in. They never wanted her to be around. So they got rid of her really as fast as they could. But she is going through a kind of very big emotional upheaval because she got scared to death working with this team and in a particular reason she was she froze when she was met with an assailant and a weapon she had continually asked for gun training and they just poo-pooed it i mean the sweeney you know when they're called out on a job they tool up and they're out and they're all very used to handling weapons anyway she's been transferred to a station in Belgravia. You know, there most of their crimes are to do with Harrods shoplifting. It's a real downer, um, very secure station. And it's lovely because she also meets um, her old friend from Hackney days, and that's Spencer Gibbs. And he's as sort of miffed about his career as she is. Anyway. What? He's so fed up. She's so fed up. And, um, oh, I, I've got a bleep in here. Somebody, what's this? Meet Bill Gates, Cranstrip. I don't know how I get rid of that. Um, I think I just elbow it out, do I? Close tab, yes. No, he's not going. Oh, I've got rid of it. It was Meet Bill Gates. Hello, Bill. Very nice to meet you. <laughs> what's he doing interrupting my Facebook? Anyway. Gibbs Spencer of the Rock and Roll Image is so fed up. He one day says, uh, you know what I really want? There's a decent crime. You know, one that I can get my teeth into. And Jane warns him. She says, you be careful what you ask for. Well, then it happens. I mean, horror, horror. Um, and the reason I wanted to really delve into a horrendous crime was because um you know uh <laughs> all the time when uh, you're looking at most cop shows and i include my own too is that um a lot of the time they're dealing with uh you know a bit of like that at Al uh a known criminal type um very rarely do you see in any detective show or even any detective novels um, when you're going in to find the perpetrators, they're not what I would call that brilliant. Even in Lewis or Old Morse, 
I, I, you know, when they were interviewing uh, professors, they all seemed to be a bit doddery. To actually come face to face with outrageously confident characters is of interest to me. And so I decided I would, with blunt force, move into a world that I knew very well. Acting. You know, I used to be one. <laughs> Quite some time ago, but nevertheless, I was one. And a very serious actress. You know, I may joke, but I was a very serious actress. Um, and I did loads of repertory theatre. Uh, I played everything you could think of. And when I was at the Royal Academy, I'll just drop that in again, the Royal Academy. <coughs> Excuse me for living. But when I was at the Royal Academy, I was there with Anthony Hopkins, Ian McShane, John Hart. And I was with a very select group of people. And it was a wonderful time. And nowadays, you know, you don't really have that many repertory theatres. But I was interested in tapping into a world that I really, really knew well. Now, some of it is also, I think everybody's been very used to the Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein and what terrible things happened to actresses um, and actors. But I wanted to just keep scratching away at that surface. And actors are very good liars. Also, agents are very good liars. You know, oh, my clan. Yes, you can speak fluent French, can't speak a word of it. Um, and it seems that actors get used to doing that kind of lie <laughs> with confidence. And I remember once an actor friend of mine, he came in and he said, I'm, I'm up for a fantastic part, but um, it's you've got to ride. and I've never been on a horse. I said, oh, well, don't be stupid. Go in, say you can ride, then go take riding lessons. I mean, if you get the part, ride lessons. So don't just say, yes, I can ride. So he called me up and he said, I've got the part. It's incredible. And I booked myself into the stables and I, I'm taking lessons. And the next time I saw him, he was on crutches. And I said, my God, what happened? Did he get thrown off the horse? And he said, no. First lesson, I was waiting as they led it out of the stable. It trod on my foot and it's broken my toe. So, you know, actors, they're up against it all the time. It's, it's constantly a source of it. And because moving to the other side when I'm casting for productions, you know, I'm very used to the lies that actors are able to say. You know, Do you drive? Yes. You know, never been in a car. And so... It's that confident level. And so then I had, to, once I knew where I was going with it and using all my old, you know, experience, I then looked and searched for a horror murder. And I found one, um, a nightmare. And so I stole it, wiggled it about. And um, that's, the case that the young Jane Tennyson and the crazy Spencer Gibbs begin to work on. And it gives me the opportunity to go back into the world that I lived as an actress and also to go into America. I mean, it's so tough out there. And I'm constantly, you know, when I'm lecturing with actors and going through audition pieces and saying, you know, there are clues that you need to actually get into your brain. The, one of the first things they have to understand is when you're going up for a job, you're usually part of a selected group of photographs that they said, oh, he looks good, I think he's right, or she's right. Yes, bring her in. So you're in with a chance as you get through the door. Then the other thing is, you know, they give you pages to learn, a few speeches. And so an actor comes in to read for a part, and we say, do you mind reading? No, no, I don't mind at all. No, thank you. So they say, okay, right, off we go. They completely hide their face. So I always say to actors, if you get given sheets with lines to audition, learn them. Then you can hold the pages down and give a little bit. We want to see your faces. So anyway, that's blunt force, which... 
Um, it's quite horrific in some parts, very funny in others, but it has given me an opportunity to go back slightly into the world that I was, you know, up to here in for years. And, um, you know, I used to exist doing advertising commercials. And that's the other part of your life as an actor. You can be playing Hedda Gabler, and then you go up the next day to um, see if you'd uh, advertise toilet rolls or anything like that. So it's a world. But what happens is the actors, actresses, you know, I don't know why we've all got to be called actors. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm all right. Nothing wrong with me. Just a bit of a tickle. Um, you know, why they have to have this confidence because you do get turned down a lot. You get rejected a lot. And so there is a kind of confidence air. And I read about this awful murder. When one of the detectives were interviewed, they were told to be very wily because they were probably interviewing somebody that could lie through their teeth and get away with it. So that confidence is something new for me to write for uh, Jane Tennyson. And I, I, I mean, I hope you enjoy it. It's, it is quite dark. <laughs> oh, so am I. Because I can't tell you what it's like working in Hollywood. If you think it's tough over here in England, my God, doing it in Hollywood, there you're in like two seconds and out. You know, you're going to go, hello. And they say, would you, would you read? No, no, she's not right. Get her out. So it's much, much tougher there. Um, and, you know, when I think of some of the jobs I've been up for. And at one time I had an agent and they said, look, Linda, you're going out for a very, very big commercial. This is worth a lot of money. So when you go in, don't admit that you've ever done any commercial because they want somebody that's not been selling crisps or wall paint or whatever. So when they say to you, have you done any commercials? You say, no, no I haven't done any at all. No, nothing. Hopefully you'll get the thing. And she said, it's worth a fortune. The same day I get another call from my agent who said, my then acting agent, who said, oh, Linda, you're up for a very nice part in the wilderness years uh, about Churchill. Uh, it's on the same day as the commercial. And so I said, oh, fine. OK, right. So idiot here. I get the directors mixed up. So I go up for the wilderness years and the director was a lovely man. And he said, so, Linda, <clears throat> tell me what you've been doing. I said, absolutely nothing. I haven't done anything at all, really. He said, no, you haven't been working. No, no, nothing. And all I could think of was ching, 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 the commercial came out. And of course, I'd got to go back to front. And I had to go back in the next day and say, look, I'm awfully sorry about that. Of course, I've been working. I've just been doing Desdemona <laughs> with the Royal Shakespeare Company. <laughs> anyway, I got the part. Wilderness years. It's not a great part, not a large part, but it was a very nice form part. Um, anyway. I'm just looking at a few notes to see if I've missed anything that I should be telling about. Um, I don't think so. Um, maybe you would like to now ask me questions. Um, some of your questions, I've got to ask, answer some of your questions, which is very odd because I don't seem to have the sheet with the questions on. Sorry about this. A bit of a fiasco. Maybe the printer missed out a page. So I should just keep on chatting, really, telling you about bits and pieces and what it's like looking up stories. And in truth, you know, it's very interesting because um, I know the lockdown is very hard for some people, but I'm very, very fortunate because. Um, I'm very used to locking myself down, so to speak. <laughs> you know, I'm in my little office 
I've just seen, you know, what's behind me. Oh, the BAFTAs. I've got two more downstairs. I keep them on display. It gives me a lot of confidence, a lot of heart. But what a lot of people really want to know is how do you do it? Where do you get the stories from? Well, I've just told you about our the blunt force, you know, how that came about. And it's like something that fascinates me, I hope, will be of interest to other people. Sometimes not. <laughs> Somebody could pick up one of my books and go, well, I've read this, very boring. No, I don't want to see that. The key is, you know, enjoyment. You know, when you start writing, you really got to get something going and clicking in your head. And over and over again, we're very lucky to have this internet. I mean, my God, I used to spend hours and days and weeks being interview, 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 gaining. Now, the information you can get off the internet is absolutely beyond belief. And that part of it is easy. You still always gain an awful lot more from people that you meet uh, and talk, and they always give you a little bit extra. I never use a, a tape recorder or I don't take a notebook uh, because I listen. And listening, you know, they're going to give you things that surprise you. You can be actually interviewing a prison officer. That's straight. Suddenly, they'll tell you something. Happened to him. Can't believe it. And then you get a, another line. So you ask them the questions that, that you need to know. Now you're going to get some of feedback from them. That feedback is what usually I run back home and work on because it's the feedback, the, the freshness of it, and then, you know, something you've never heard before, never knew happened before. And it's like that area of research is very exciting to do. And I encourage writers, you know, just pick up the phone, look where, wherever you want. And over and over again, you get information that you cannot believe is coming to you. So you say, well, how do I get to the Metropolitan Police? You ring up the Metropolitan Police. They are very accommodating. You know, you, you say, I'm a writer and I'm very serious and I'd like to know about this. And say yes. And they will put you in touch with somebody or they'll allow you to go to a station and talk. As soon as you sit in in a station and you watch what's going on, the fodder, it's like, here it comes, here it comes, all this information. And you know, time and time again, I have been lifted with a story that somebody has told me apropos of me doing research. And I always go back to the original research for Prime Suspect with the DCI that helped me. And she was an absolute mine of information, but she made me match it. You know, she said, do you need to sit in an incident room? Will you go to, I said, yes, I'll go. I'll, I don't mind, yeah, I'll go to an incident room. Have you been to an autopsy? Yes, I, well, I hadn't, you know. And it's quite famous because I fainted at the first post-mortem I went to. Um, and over and over again, I have found the feedback which generates and you get more and more excited as you're working because it's coming out. You know, I know a lot of writers get what they call writer's block. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Um, I sometimes wouldn't mind a bit of a block. It's like coming out of me at such a level and be being forced into this lockdown, even more than usual, is really... It's the, the, you know, it's the third eye. You open that third eye. And when you open that third eye, everything comes in. And I sit in my little room, talking away to myself, chattering away. Um, I get very emotional too. Um, cry. I've been known to be roaring with laughter one minute, crying the next. But it's that. And... And then you have the moment where you've finished. And so that process of the writing, going through it over and over again. I've just had a ping here on my phone. It may be somebody asking me a question and telling me to shut up. I'll just test. 
Here we go. Yes, it is. Questions for Facebook. Please print off and have in front of you. Ha! Here we go. Hang on. <laughs> uh, oh, got them live. Isn't this fun? It's amazing, isn't it? Now I'm going to have to get my glasses because I can't actually read without them. Just pay attention to the BAFTAs behind you. And beside the BAFTAs is me as Calamity Jane. I'm sort of a bit like her anyway. Okay, first question coming up. Uh, oh, this is very nice. This is from Twitter. And it's a huge fan. Can I ask you where the inspiration came from for Jane Tennyson? What was the light bulb moment? Well, I think I've covered that. Also, did you ever think she would become such an iconic character? Never in my wildest dreams. Nor did they, the production company. They didn't even like her. Oh, they're coming in fast and furious now. Uh, I've got from Andrew on the website. Oh, he loved Very, my last book. I have, oh, listen to them. They're coming in. Isn't this amazing? Technology. Hang on a second. I do happen to have very close by. Very. Oh, this is such a good book. I do thank you all. I can't tell you. Do you know it's been in the top 10 for 10 weeks? God bless you all that have put your little hands in your pockets and bought it. I appreciate you all. I'll just get back to the questions now. Okay. Uh, Andrew. What buried for his girlfriend? And... I won't give the plot away, but I would like to read more about Jack's real father and his murky past. <laughs> well, I can't really discuss that because if I do, I'm going to spoil it for readers, new readers of Buried. Um, but he, he has a very, very murky past. And I would suggest to Andrew to have a look at the original series of Widows you get a lot of info about the query he's asked. Now I've got Susan Bester. Oh, she's just finished Cold Shoulder. Uh, why did you base the book in Los Angeles and was Lorraine Page based on someone you met? Ha ha. Lorraine Page is the character from a trilogy. It's called Cold Shoulder, Cold Blood, Cold Heart. Three Fabulous books, though I say so myself. <laughs> I've got nobody here to stop me anyway now. But yes, it was based on a real character. And I was in Los Angeles um, doing something or other, I don't know. And I was staying at quite a posh hotel because I'd been sent over there by a company. And the reception called and they said, oh, there's a journalist to see you. And I said, oh, really? Uh, she said, yes. Uh, well, I think she's a journalist. Um, I said, oh, well, send her up, because I've probably forgotten it. Anyway, I knew there was a kind of tap, then the door opened, and I knew just on one look, this was no journalist. She had uh, bleached hair with thick black roots, and she had a kind of, oh, very tight top, funny skirt, white high heel shoes and stockings with an awful lot of holes in them. And I, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't catch your name. It wasn't Lorraine Page, but close. And she said, um, I'll do her. She said, I'm Lorraine Page. And she said, I saw you interviewed on TV. And uh, apparently you buy stories. So I got a story and, uh, you know, I'm round here. So I said, oh, oh, well, I thought she might get a gun out and shoot me. But anyway, I said, oh, fine. Well, I said, look, I'll tell you something, Lorraine. One of the big problems is when I say I'll buy a story is, truthfully, it can be very boring. You know, I, I don't have the time. If you're going to tell me a lengthy, lengthy story that you want me to buy, I said, but. If you can tell me it in a few lines, um, then 
I'm interested or I'm not. She says, okay, okay. I said, so, well, a few lines, tell me what your story is. And she said, um, I was a lieutenant in the force out here and uh, I shot a kid. I was drunk on duty and I was cold shoulder. They kicked me out. I lost everything. I'm a hooker and I'm a junkie. He said, how about that, hey? So I said, well, I have to say, <laughs> it's pretty hot stuff. Anyway, cut a very long story short. I was attached to her for about four months and it was a nightmare. She was a nightmare. But she was also one of the most complex, fascinating women I've ever met in my life. She was the toughest woman I've ever met. Um, and one of the saddest women I've ever met. And in reality, you know, the trilogy could have gone on for much longer, but I could not deal with her. Um, so there's three books. So thank you very much for that question. Um, Susan Bester, a Facebook. Um, and I said it in Los Angeles because that's where Lorraine Page had been a police, a lieutenant. Okay, now I've got another one from Cara Brown. Oh, Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> oh, I'm going far afield for this time, isn't it? Oh, oh, here we are, everybody. Far afield on the website. This is, um, oh, she saw me at a library event in Chilong in Melbourne. Um, it was the most amazing brand new library I've ever been to in my life. Absolute, so modern, superb. Um, <clears throat> you said you might set a book in Australia. Have you thought any more about it? I've just finished Buried and I love Jack War. Can't wait for the next one. Oh, thank you very much, Cara. Well, I'm just trying to think how much I can tell you, but it may be connected to Jack War. And there is a very strong Australian link. So good as my word, I've done it. I've done it. It won't be out for a while, but a lot of Australia in it. Okay, David via Twitter. Um, he's read a lot of my books. He's up to Murder Mile, which is the one before the Deadly Dozen. Dirty Dozen. What do I say? Deadly Dirty Dozen. Um, oh, he's also read all the above suspicion books. Uh, I love those books. Anna Travis in Above Suspicion or the Young Jane Tennyson. Do you think you'll write a new Above Suspicion? I need to know if Anna and James Langton get together. <laughs> well, you know, this is such a coincidence because I keep going on and on about being writing like a dingbat throughout all this. I have just started on an Anna Travis novel. But, you know, David, it's a long time ago since she's been on the screen. So it's an up to date. I, I won't tell you much more, but uh, she's been working as a profiler in Quantico, USA, Florida. So it's coming. A new book, Anna Travis, James Langton. I always fancied him, that actor. Oof. Anyway, I will continue until, seriously speaking, Oh, it says, well, that's all for now. Thank you very much for joining me. Well, I think that's a key to say I have to go. Well, I'm very, very sorry I'm going. Um, I hope I have had something that you can go away with. <laughs> Just to know that I'm always up for a laugh. And also, very importantly, I'm also, there's another side to me that I don't often show people as a very, very serious, dedicated side. I don't often show it because she's quite boring, but I am a bit of a workaholic, but I love what I do. And my appreciation of the fans that I have is just non-ending. 
uh, I, I mean, it goes on. The lovely feedback I get is so important. I think it's important to every writer. But for me, I am absolutely, uh, my fans mean the world to me and I can't thank you enough. And I hope the lockdown is easing a bit and um, you're all keeping well and safe, but do continue to take care. It isn't quite over yet, but God bless you all. And thank you for being with me. And I'm not having a gin and tonic tonight. I've got a drop of whiskey in the rich juice. 